Welcome to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, where we take you behind the scenes with peak performers to learn what makes them tick and discover how you can apply their lessons to your life. I'm your host, Molly Fletcher. Introverts make up a third to half of the population. And if you aren't one yourself, please don't stop listening to today's episode. Today's guest, Susan Kane, is the author of Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for seven years and has been translated into 40 languages. Susan's TED Talk on the same topic has been viewed over 30 million times on TED.com, YouTube, And Bill Gates says it was one of his all-time favorite talks. In Quiet, Susan argues that we dramatically undervalue introverts and in doing so are missing out on their immense talents. After all, we're talking about the likes of Rosa Parks, Warren Buffett, Michael Jordan, and Albert Einstein, to name a few. In today's conversation, Susan shares the greatest misconceptions about introverts, why we need more introverted leaders, and the shift she's seen since writing Quiet. If you enjoy this episode, share it with someone in your life who would appreciate it. You can also leave a rating or review on Apple Podcasts to help others discover the show. Whether you identify as an introvert or count your loved ones and colleagues as introverts, there is something for everyone to take away from this episode. Let's dig right in. Here's my conversation with Susan Kane. Well, Susan Kane, what a treat to have you on. You're a busy woman. Thank you for for taking a minute. I'm so looking forward to this. Me too. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's a pleasure. You know, I want to start here. Your book, Quiet, really sparked a conversation about the power of, of introverts that wasn't happening. That conversation wasn't happening. And, you know, so I was curious to start, where in your own life did this sort of start? What experiences happened to you in your own life that really allowed this book to bubble up in you and the story you wanted to share? I think as is probably true for most people with those questions, it's always a question of like, well, how far back do you want to go? You know, (laughs) because um, I can point to times when I was four years old and was thinking about this, obviously not in with this kind of vocabulary, but, you know, just having the experience as a kid of wanting to play in a very specific way that was not the sort of ordained way that you would play in an institutional setting. So, you know, like at camp or at school, the the idea you're supposed to play in big groups, but I usually preferred to play with kind of one friend at a time. But then in terms of like when it really started to happen, I think it really, later in life, I was a corporate lawyer um, and I was always really interested in um, mentoring and, um, like I was always serving on all the, the firm committees that had to do with how people thrived. And the only language that we had for talking about those kinds of questions was the language of gender and race, which I certainly thought were important. But I also thought there was this big missing piece uh, that it would explain people's different reactions to situations like negotiations and meetings and just how you showed up in general. And I started to realize that the missing piece was temperament and personality and specifically introversion, extroversion. And it was so weird. There was no one talking about it and no, like no way to talk about it. It would have been weird to bring it up. Yeah. It just would have seemed odd at the time. So I guess I felt like I needed to write about that. Well, and it's been a smashing uh, success to put it, to put it mildly. It's interesting because a lot of people think about introversion and shyness as the same thing. And you talk about this. How are they different? And what's a good definition of of introversion? So introversion is about where do you draw your energy? Mm -hmm. So an introverted person will tend to feel most alive, switched on when they're in a situation where things are just a little more mellow around them where they feel at their best and an extrovert feels her best when the situation is lots of hubbub around you and you know of course we these aren't 
hard and fast. We, we all sort of shift throughout the day, but in general, it's kind of like that. And shyness is more about the fear of social judgment and being especially sensitive to being judged by other people. So my work is really about both, even though I use the word introvert more, I'm also really concerned with shyness as well. And in real life, they tend to, even though the motivations are different, they, they can kind of show up in similar ways because you could have a person who, for example, tends to be a little more reserved. Is it because they're introverted or is it because they're shy? Mm. Could be either one, but the way that behavior is received in American culture is very similar. And there's a spectrum here, I would imagine, that people can kind of flow from. And, and can you give our listeners a sense of what percentage of people in the world are sort of introverts, extroverts, and then you talk about ambiverts? Yeah, I mean, in general, and, and it does vary from country to country because some of this is culturally determined. In general, people are, it's about half the population is introverted and half the population is extroverted. And most people, I think, lean, I would imagine, you know this better than I do, right? Lean one way or another. So if someone is listening and says, gosh, I'm not sure, you know, how do you tell them to gain that level of clarity around? Are, are they more introverted or extroverted? Well, I mean, it could be, if you're not sure, it might be because you really are ambiverted. So you really are kind of in the middle of the spectrum. It could, though, be that you are just so accustomed to acting in a certain way that you decided you were supposed to or that you decided would serve you. So what I would advise you is to ask yourself, how would you spend your typical Saturday if you had zero social or professional obligations on that day? You could really do whatever you want. How, what would you do? And how many people would you do it with? Who would you do it with? And I think that gives you a real sense as to who you really are underneath all the um, social habits you might have gotten into. How much of it do you see in your research and your work is, is genetics, uh, you know, Susan versus environment, and, and how fixed it is, is it when you think about sort of those two spaces? So this is considered introversion, extroversion, one of the most heritable of all the personality traits. But having said that, that still means it's about 50-50 um, on a group level. So we're all kind of a mix of nature and nurture. I think most parents will tell you, you, know, you, you can see in your babies quite early um, a tendency to be one way or another. So, and, and that's before there's been too much environmental influence. And, and there are also studies that have kind of measured different aspects of, of babies' behavior and nervous system responses um, from the time they're four days old. And then they track them throughout their lives and and there is this correlation between the way they show up at four days and the way they're still showing up 20 years later. Wow. Um, yeah, yeah. So there really is a big genetic component, um, but it's not everything. How much can the environment impact it, right? In other words, do people throughout their lives tend to sort of shift a little bit on the spectrum at some level? They definitely shift. Okay. I mean, you know, if you think about just all the different skills that a person acquires throughout their lives, so... You know, we might acquire the skill to meditate and be in a room with ourselves alone, um, mm -hmm. which for an extroverted person might not have felt natural. Um, we might acquire the skill to give a speech, um, even though that would have <laughs> seemed very daunting when mm -hmm. we were younger. Mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you acquire all these different skills. And once you acquire the skill, then you start, then you start using that skill. It becomes part of your daily practice, and that ends up kind of shaping who you are and how do you interact with the world. And, and so all this stuff is so complicated. So yeah, we, we do shift, but you don't see like a kid who's super extroverted mm -hmm. tend to become super introverted okay. by the time they're 40. Like, <laughs> right. you know, that, so there's sort of like a limit to how much people shift, but yeah, there's plenty of room for growth and change. Well, and it's interesting. There's, there's a lot of misconceptions about introverts that you talk about, which is why I sort of love that your first career was a wall street lawyer and now you ironically are a, a public speaker who talks, okay, about obviously introversion. So tell me, how does that show up in your story? I'll tell you one way in which it shows up, which is, as you said, I am ironically a public speaker now by profession. <laughs> like there's hardly ever a month where that goes by where I'm not giving at least several talks. Right. Um, and people will say to me often, 
oh, you know, now that you're a public speaker, I guess you're not an introvert anymore. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> right. Sure. Um, so there's this feeling like, oh, you know, if you're A, you couldn't possibly do B. And people are so much more complicated than mm-hmm. that. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, like, actually on the lecture circuit, I would guess that most of the speakers who I meet are also introverts. They happen not to be talking about it the way I do. But I think a lot of them are, a lot of them are people who have been, they're the kind of people who have been captivated enough by a single idea that they've gone and written a book about it or thought about it deeply. And that's why they're now speaking about it for 45 minutes at a time, you know, on a stage. So yeah, these things are not as hard and fast as we think. So for you personally, as you were growing up, sort of feeling this internal tug, but then you became a Wall Street lawyer. Was there a path in which you were sort of leaning into this world that we live in, this pull of introversion inside of yourself, but you know what, I'm, I'm not going to lean into this yet. I'm going to go do this lawyer sort of thing, and then I'll lean into who I really think and what I really think. I mean, is that did that happen at all? Or I mean, and I, and I don't know that. I mean, I'm just curious. Well, I mean, it happened, but I actually think that had a lot less to do with introversion per okay. se. Okay. Um, I think a lot of lawyers are introverts. I do think I was not a natural Wall Street lawyer in a million different ways. But yeah, but it wasn't so much about introversion. It was more, um, I actually had this moment um, a few years into the practice of law when I felt like, okay, you know, I'm sort of decent at this, but this doesn't feel right. Um, and I, um, I read this book called Do What You Are, which helped you figure out what your personality style was, according to Myers-Briggs. And, um, and then it helped you kind of match your personality type to the ideal career for you. And my type, the, the careers that were listed were all like writer, counselor, psychologist, social worker, Mm, clergy person. Yeah. I was like, (laughs) you know, it sort of explained why I was serving on all those committees, like all the mentoring Uh, committees and things in my firm, but it didn't (laughs) explain why I was practicing Wall Street law in the first place. Right. So eventually I made that change. Yeah, that's cool. One of the things that uh, we do as a company is negotiation training. So I found it super cool that you ran your own negotiation consultancy firm. So I'm curious, how can introverts leverage their strengths, their gifts, certainly inside of negotiation. It's so funny because I was actually teaching this long before I ever even thought of writing this book. Mm -hmm. When I was doing the negotiation training, the first thing that I would always tell people is that people assume that it's like a certain type of person who would be a good negotiator. And that's really not true. It's more a question of skills that you learn. Um, And also some of those skills I think do come more easily to introverts than extroverts. I mean, so you know about how um, a lot of what makes a good negotiation is being able to listen to the other side and figure out what are their underlying interests. No you know, as opposed to like, you know, we, we always think it's like, like I have this position and you have that position. If you follow it that way, you're just arguing up about positions when you really might be motivated by something deeper than what you're saying at that moment. So if you're the person who can, ask a lot of questions and listen to the answer and not get hot headed about it, but just, you know, try kind of calmly to figure out how do we come up with a solution that's going to serve both of us. The best negotiators are, are really doing that. And I think that's something introverts can do very well. One of the things I've seen in our training is that we teach that the pause is so powerful and important inside of negotiations. I mean, a pause can be, you know, 30 seconds, a minute, but introverts are obviously at times can be maybe more introspective, slower to to react. And so I think naturally an introvert does that pause component well, which sends a powerful message often inside of these difficult conversations. Yeah, I think that's right. I would say the other piece that introverts have for negotiation is research. Um, you know, mm-hmm. that so much of what happens in a negotiation happens before you ever get into the room. You know, if you think of the classic salary negotiation, you're much better off having really done your research to find out what similar jobs are paying or that kind of thing, um, and anchoring what you're asking for to external standards as opposed to making it a, a battle of wills and taking the 
the time and sort of the thorough care to do that research. Obviously, something everyone can do, um, but something I've found many, that comes easily to many introverts. We'll get right back to the show, but first, I want to share with you a free video series that I created just for you. Too often, we assume that our potential is some lofty vision hanging over our heads, but never quite attainable. But in reality, our potential is built in small moments. A pro athlete delivers a clutch performance in the biggest games because he executed it a thousand times in practice. The same goes for you. Master the little moments so you're ready for the big moments. My free Unleash Your Potential video series walks you through three simple steps to move closer to what you really are capable of. To get free access, visit 5minutepotential.com. That's five, the number five, minutepotential.com. So, you know, Quiet was released in 2012, right? Which, what shift, I mean, you being out speaking and connecting certainly with lots of people on lots of different levels, what shift have you seen, particularly in corporate America, right, since Quiet was released? Oh my gosh, I I find the shift to be enormous. Um, So awesome. I know, it's crazy. Yeah, it's so cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I just see, like even just from the companies who are in, inviting me to speak in the context in which they're they're doing it it's very often okay this is now part of our diversity and inclusion agenda the question of different temperaments and like i i just don't think anyone was talking like that 10 years ago no um sure it's just really exciting and and i just see companies are much more aware of having many introverts in their midst and thinking hmm maybe we're not doing (laughs) as good a job as we could be um (laughs) And then, you know, and then you just see it in these other, I don't know, more amorphous ways. Um, A friend who was a professor at Harvard Business School told me that she would always start her leadership classes by having people take a personality test. And it used to be that she would have a room full of students claiming all of them were extroverts, you know, having taken the test. And she says now, you know, 50% of them will say, oh, yeah, I'm an introvert. And they feel perfectly fine about that. So, you know, so you see the the shifts in subtle ways like that, too. And we've seen trends like open office floor plans fail, right? Do you see any other similar well-intentioned trends, right? Super well-intentioned trends in corporate, in the corporate world that, that maybe we should be a little bit wary about? You mean besides open office plans? Right. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah, it's so um, interesting to hear you talk about that. I would say in general, just the nature of any office is inherently um, going to favor extroverts because you've got, you know, a collection full of people who are there together in one space. The whole question of meetings is interesting because you really can't get anything done without having people share information and, um, and exchange ideas and figure out together how they're going to make decisions. And at the same time, there becomes this sort of inevitable creep towards getting people together in meetings um, throughout the day to make that happen. And that becomes an incredible drain on everybody's time, but it becomes an especial energy drain for the introverts who are involved. Um, So for them, it's not only a time dream, it's also an energy dream. So I think the push that we have in general to rethinking meeting culture is especially important around this topic. What should people do, you know, instead? Well, one thing would be, you know, I'm I'm a big believer in chunking of time, um, in in giving people chunks of time in which to get whatever it is done. So if you set aside periods of the day or days of the week or what have you, where you just say, well, we're not having meetings during these times. Um, these are the times of the day that are devoted to deep flow, to deep work. That's really productive for everyone. Yeah, for sure. Cal came on the show, and I love his book on deep work. Me too. I'm such a big believer in what he talks about. Yeah, for Absolutely. sure. So, so how does introversion versus extroversion tend to show up you know, in work preferences and maybe behaviors? Like, what, How does that show up at work in regards to the sort of the 
the preferences in general, right, between the two? And how does that at times bubble up and conflict? In other words, maybe if, if somebody's listening who's a leader who's an extrovert and they have introverts that work for them, or you're a leader and you're an introvert and you have extroverts, what are some of the things that you recommend that people do in order to drive, you know, connection and, and results um, and, and lift the energy up of everybody in the room while honoring who each other authentically is? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, what we were talking about really gets to some of the heart of it. You know, you never want to these blanket generalizations, but we can say in general, extroverts will tend to want to connect frequently with the people they're working with to get feedback or just like, how are you doing? Or just, I want to check in and mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and I've heard from extroverts who work on teams made up of introverts. And they, they kind of feel they're, you know, sort of like floating alone out there and craving connection. And the culture of their work team is very much to put your head down and not be interacting enough from an extrovert's point of view. Then you have introverts working in very extroverted teams who will have the opposite feeling of like, all I want to do is be able to put my head down and not be interrupted and not be all to the next office birthday party, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> be able to focus, right? Like that. Sure. Um, and so the best thing that you can do as a leader of a team is get people talking in a friendly, open way about what these differences are so that you can get to a point where it becomes kind of like socially acceptable to chat about it and affectionately rib each other about it um, and make allowances for each other. How can you harness the talents of introverts on your team? I mean, what are the, some of the tactics? I know you work inside of organizations and, and help organizations with this. What are some of the tactics that you hear work to really harness the gifts of introverts? Well, I mean, for one thing, you want to be careful when you are running any kind of group discussion to make sure that you are really getting input from everyone. So techniques like letting everybody know in advance what you're going to be talking about. I, I actually mm. love the idea that we hear coming out of Amazon where they um, apparently at any meeting of import, um, the person running the meeting prepares a memo, like a, like a six page single page memo beforehand. And then they all spend the first half an hour of their meeting time sitting together, quietly reading the memo. And that's really useful for everybody because it, it's giving everybody a time to think and to process before you're actually having a free-for-all um, exchange. There's a technique that comes out of education called Think, Pair, Share, where um, if you have an idea to decide on, you have people sit by themselves and think about it first. Then you pair up, you know, in this case, students um, to talk about it just one-on-one -on -one before you share it out with the group. And that gives everybody the chance to articulate their ideas out loud to one other person and it becomes much more likely that everybody then is going to share from there. Sure. So techniques like that okay. go a long way. How does this relate to, you know, creativity, right? And productivity, how does all this show up in, in, in that space, in that regard? We have this belief nowadays that creativity comes from a very, very gregarious process of people you know, there's this idea, get everybody out of yeah, their yeah. silos, get we have to exchange ideas, get the whiteboard out, that whole thing. Sure. Uh, you know, and uh, of course there's validity to that because the creativity does require the fertilization of lots of great ideas. But we also know it, it requires a heck of a lot of solitude for the creative process to really flourish. So, um, you know, coming back to the Cal Newport view of the world, um, we really do need, and this is for the extroverts too, to get everybody into a state where they can get into deep think mode if we really want them at their most creative. And we know that from a bunch of studies, um, including brainstorming studies that find that people brainstorm or produce more ideas and better ideas when they're by themselves than when they're in a group of people. Um, and that's true for extroverts as well as for introverts. I think the only sensible way to do brainstorming is really in a hybrid process where you're sending people off for solo deep think um, before you bring them all together. You talk about the myth of, I think this is interesting because we're both uh, friends with Adams Grant, Grant and a fan of his work and, and, and research. And, you know, you talk about the myth 
of, of sort of charismatic leadership. Adam found that, that introverted leaders often deliver better outcomes than extroverted leaders. So, which is interesting, what skills do introverted leaders bring versus extroverted leaders? Well, there's a bunch of them. And one of the ones that Adam found in his studies is that introverted leaders are more likely to solicit the ideas of the people who work for them. Whereas an extrovert is more likely to kind of, um, you know, kind of be really excited and sort of put their, their own stamp on things because they're more dominant in their interaction. And what happens with dominance is you're not actually hearing from other people as much. Um, so what, what he actually found in one of his studies is that um, the extroverted leaders had better results when their employees were less proactive and, and they needed, you know, sort of like the charisma and the rousing of an extroverted leader. And the introverted leaders had better outcomes when the employees were proactive because in those cases they could really harness the proactive ideas coming from those people. I think it's kind of interesting because you talk about how you're married to an extrovert. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, you have some personal experience here. What are like one to two things that you would say you try to do when communicating with your husband who, who's an extrovert and that he maybe tries to do when communicating with you as an introvert that helps drive certainly connection? I mean, it's funny because at least for my husband and me in our day-to-day life, we actually benefit a lot from the ways in which introverts and extroverts are complementary. And I think it's, mm-hmm. it's worth pausing to think about that for a minute because when we talk about introverts and extroverts, we, we tend to assume, okay, the issue is going to be how do we manage our differences? But we forget that those differences can be really attractive and make things in, in certain ways more harmonious because, and, and this is true in work as well as in marriages, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. That, that introverts and extroverts tend to like each other's company and flow really well together because you're each contributing such different things and it's easy to appreciate the other person's contribution. So I really like it that my husband does so much of the talking because <laughs> I, like, I want someone to do it. I don't, I don't want to be doing all the talking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think he really likes it that I tend to like be sort of going off and coming up with some thought or idea that you wouldn't come up with as much if you were more, if you were talking a lot and skimming on the surface mm-hmm, more. Mm-hmm. Um, so we really appreciate each other that way. One place where we've had to really figure it out is when it comes to handling conflict. And this comes up a lot in the workplace, um, you know, that extroverts tend to have a more confrontational style of dealing with conflict, which to an introvert feels like aggression and disrespect. Um, And introverts will tend to have a more tamped down style of handling conflict, which to an extrovert can feel like lack of caring or lack of engagement. So that's, that's a place where, where people really need to do a lot of affirmative work. Mm -hmm. Usually, Sure. Sure. How do you think this plays into the social media world that we live in? You talk a little bit about it in the book about the, and you say, you know, quote, cult of personality today. And so I'm curious about your perspective, you know, really an experience uh, as it relates to social media. Yeah, I mean, social media is such a mixed bag that way, right? Mm -hmm. Because there are some ways in which it's the great leveling for all personality styles because you can do so much sharing, interacting, self-expression and so on um, without ever leaving your house. And so you hear a lot of introverts describe themselves as online extroverts and (laughs) real-life introverts. Okay, Like there's definitely that phenomenon. But... There's also a difference in the way introverts and extroverts tend to interact online. Um, mm-hmm. Introverts will tend not to sort of like a random share as much um, as extroverts will. They'll tend to reserve their likes for the subjects that are really um, of importance to them. Um, or so you see those kinds of differences. That's interesting. You know, and I, I think all of us um, these days struggle with the the pressure that people feel to be on all the time on social media, Mm -hmm. you know, and I I think that's probably true for extroverts as well. What advice do you have for folks that feel that way? 
I think people really need to figure out what is going to, what their way is going to be of interacting on social media mm-hmm. and stick to that mm-hmm. and then not worry so much about what other people are doing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. I just wrote a book called The Energy Clock. And as I reread Quiet in, in anticipation of our conversation today, so much of what you talk about has to do with energy. Uh, so I'm just curious for you, you know, how do you personally restore your energy when it's drained? Yeah, I guess I a bunch of different ways of doing it. I mean, I, I sort of have my favorite things to do and I do my favorite things. So my favorite things are like, they're hanging out with my family. They're sitting in a cafe with my laptop writing. They're playing tennis and doing yoga. And so like, I try to structure my days so that as many of my days as possible have all three of those things that I just said in them. And that makes me really happy. That's cool. Well, I need to send you the energy clock because that's what the book, it talks about how are, can we be intentional about scheduling the things that lift us up, the things that give us energy in our days. Every day, that's the whole book. That's the whole thing. It's an energy audit. I'm so glad that you're doing that. I think that's so important. And don't you find like people feel kind of guilty about scheduling yes. in the things that they like to do? That feels like, oh, that's the... You know, it's like the equivalent of eating the bonbons, right. but it's really not. It's actually in a totally different category. Correct. Because if you don't get your tennis in or you don't get a little time at a cafe or your yoga, then you don't have the energy to, to get up and, 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 and do what you do so incredibly well in sharing all of your work. So um, no question. So, Susan, we end with rapid fire. I'm going to fire off a couple quick questions for you, and you just tell me what comes up. All right? Yes. Morning person or night person? Night person. That last book you read? Reading, as I often do, um, The Essential Rumi. It's one of my favorites. Got it. Okay. The book you recommend most often? One book I recommend a lot is Waking Up by Sam Harris. Mm, Love it. Okay. Yep. Favorite author? I don't currently have a favorite author. <laughs> okay. I just love them all. That's I awesome. I mean, I love many of them. Yeah, 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 I get it. I get it. Most memorable career moment to date? I guess both of my TED Talks. Yeah. 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 The show is called Game Changers. So, one last question Who's a game changer that inspires you and why? I'm going to say Gandhi. He mm. had a, this famous. <laughs> way of putting it he said in a gentle way you can shake the world Mm. and i think we can all live by that you got a little bit of that in you i think we all do (laughs) susan thank you so much you are a busy woman and uh the work that you're doing is changing people's organizations so thank you thank you so much molly and good luck absolutely you too you be safe okay have an amazing year you too take care Thanks, as always, for listening to Game Changers with Molly Fletcher. If you like the show, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts. There you can listen to previous episodes and leave us a review, which helps other people find out about the show. For more about me, visit mollyfletcher.com. Until next time, stay curious and be bold.